everyone, and welcome to Central. We are so glad you're here with us today. If you're joining us online today, let us know where you're watching from in the chat window, and we would love for you to take a moment right now to share this experience on whatever platform you're watching it on. It goes a long way in helping us spread the word about this amazing community of faith we have. If you're new here and haven't had a chance to connect with someone on our team, we'd love to meet you. If you're joining us in person after today's experience, head to the connections wall in our lobby to meet some of our pastoral team and volunteers in blue shirts. They're ready to answer any questions you may have and help you find a way to get connected. And if you're joining us online, we'd love to hear from you as well and invite you to reach out to our online hosts in the chat window right now. We want you to be a part of what is happening here today and they are there to help answer any questions you may have. Here at Central, our vision is simple, helping you connect with God and each other. That's it. Everything we do here from Sunday experiences and groups to our kids and youth programs revolves around those two things. Today, to help you connect with God, we want to encourage you to open your heart to experience the love that God has for you as we worship together. Connection to God can look different for everyone, but want you to know that this is a safe place to explore your faith and relationship with Him. In fact, later this morning, we'll be taking time to connect with God through communion. Communion is a simple way for us to remember the sacrifice Jesus made for us by his death. And we want to invite you, if you're comfortable and are a follower of Jesus, to participate with us today as we remember what Jesus has done for us. You should have received an emblem as you came into the auditorium today. If not, you can make your way to the back and one of our hosts will be happy to get one for you. And if you're watching online, why not take this opportunity before we begin to grab some crackers and juice or whatever you may have on hand so you can join us later in the experience as well. Then to help you connect with others, we have groups. Our groups are designed with you in mind and how we can best serve you in your next steps. So to make sure we have something for everyone, we have four types of groups here at Central. Community groups, small groups, interest groups, and support groups. Each group is led by a leader that is committed to helping you connect to God and others that are on the same journey. We have a number of groups starting up for the summer and there's still time to join. You can find more about those by visiting our website at centralcc.ca slash groups and search the list of options there or head to the connections wall after today's experience and someone from our team will be happy to help you. Today, I want to take a moment just to let you know of a couple things we have happening around here. Encounter is tonight. Join us at 6 p.m. for this one-hour worship and prayer experience. We are looking forward to coming together tonight and want to encourage you to bring your whole family with you as we want to spend time praying together for our families. We believe the home should be the spiritual center for our families, and it is our desire to help you grow as a family. So this night is for everyone as we lean in on God and what He has for each of us and our family. For those of you with younger kids, there's kids programming for ages five and under available. We know lives can be transformed when we encounter God, and we look forward to seeing you tonight. Are you a podcast listener? Do you know we have a central podcast? Listen to our weekly messages on the go, in your car, and on your phone, however you listen. Make sure you subscribe to our channel on whatever platform you use to be updated each week when new podcasts are posted. It's a great way for you to stay connected or get caught up if you've missed a week. Podcasts are available in both English and Spanish and are available on all podcast platforms, including our YouTube channel. Be sure to check it out this week. If you have any questions about anything we have mentioned today, you can text our number at 905-937-5610 or head over to our website at centralcc.ca slash connect. It's your best resource to stay updated on everything we've talked about today. You can also scan the QR code on the seat back in front of you and complete a connection card. And as always, you can head out to the connections wall following the experience, and we'd love to have a conversation and help in any way we can. So that's all for me today. Our experience is about to begin. So why don't you stand with me as we worship together?
In English, we say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. What a beautiful picture of all of heaven and all creation, singing that to our God. So lift your voices right now and just sing to him from a love from your heart.
line in the song that we just sang where it says, my sin was great, but your love was greater. And that's good news for us today. That's the essence of the gospel. Where through Christ, in Christ, God was reconciling the world back to himself, not counting people's sins against them. It's a message of reconciliation, restoration. You may be seated. Over the last few Sundays, we've been hearing about how to build stronger families, stronger relationships. And each family, every relationship will go through some conflict, through some, some pain, some hardships, offenses. The thing is, if it's not dealt with, if there's an offense, if there's conflict and it's not resolved, relationships grow apart. There's pain and hurt that festers, if you will, in families and couples. Relationship that God had with humanity was also broken. Since the time of Adam and Eve, we are told that they chose to disobey, they chose to go their own way apart from God's plan, they chose to do things on their own, wrong choices, wrong thinking, wrong plans, but God had a solution. He chose to forgive by sending his son, Jesus, a sinless son of God. And today we're remembering that very act, that Jesus who knew no sin became sin. He, he bore our sins, he took our sins onto the cross and paid for us so that we might be restored into relationship with God, reconciled as a family of God again. That we might become fully alive to the plans and the purposes that he, he has for each and every one of us. Today, if, you, if you're a follower of Jesus, you are taking time to confess your sin, and taking time to recommit your life to God's plan, His purposes, and you're taking time to celebrate all that Jesus has done. If you're not a follower of Jesus, this could be your very first communion. This could be your very first time you experience the love of God. And it just simply begins by admitting that you're a sinner. We are sinners in need of a savior. I wanna give you a moment just to pause right now, just to reflect again on the great sacrifice. There was a cost for us to be forgiven. Jesus gave up his life so that you and I could experience and know and have the life of God in us. Let's just take a moment right now. You can just speak to God on your own. You don't need fancy words. You can just talk to God just as you were talking to me or to the person next to you. Just tell him what's going on. He already knows. But just tell him what's going on, what's on your heart, what's on your mind. the communion packet if you want to just open up the first layer you can access the wafer we're going to just go and read the words that Paul gives us in the first letter to the Corinthians where he remembers the meal that Jesus had with his disciples on his last evening with them before he was to be crucified the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and said this is my body which is for you 
Do this in remembrance of me. Let's eat together. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's drink together. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Father, we are so grateful today. For it was your move. You took the first step towards us through your son, Jesus, so that we would know and experience love, experience forgiveness, and be reconciled back to you as one family. And so, God, we pray that this love that we have experienced, God, that we would extend it to others, this message of reconciliation, Lord, that we would be those agents of reconciliation in the relationships that are around us, in the workplaces, at school, in our own families, wherever that may be. God, let us be that agent of reconciliation. Where we need to forgive, Lord, that we would forgive in your name where we need to be forgiven, that we would just go and ask for forgiveness, knowing that you ultimately are the one that has forgiven us. And so we thank you for the peace and love, and I just pray that healing would just flow into every individual here, every family, whether it's bodily, whether it's relational, whether it's financial. Uh, Father, we just thank you that right now we are in your blessing because of what your son has done for us, and we receive all of this. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Yes, we are in a battle, but the battle is not against our kids. Our fight is for our kids. The truth is that we are in a battle right now in our culture for the hearts and the minds and the values of our children. And I know that the temptation may be to look around and feel like we are losing, but in this series, we've been re-engaging with the idea that we as grandparents or parents or influencers, any opportunity we have to invest in the next generation matters because every leader knows if you invest into the minds and values of the next generation, you can actually change things. And I am convinced if we want to change our nation, if we want to reclaim it back to its intended purpose, it starts with us taking responsibility to invest in the next generation. And that's what this series is all about. We've been exploring for four weeks how to parent in the 21st century because it is definitely not easy. And if you're just joining us, I'm gonna give you a quick recap, but I also want you to know that this series was inspired by North Point Church in Atlanta and the pastor there is Andy Stanley. And so you can go online and watch all of his sermon series on this as well and get his thoughts around this subject. But in week number one, we explored the passage in the Bible that says, train up a child in the way that they should go, right? And we learned that our responsibility is to equip them with tools. Whether they ever use them or not, it's on them, but we are to give them the tools to be successful in life and we also learned that the best way is to model it. Values aren't always taught, but they are always caught. 
what you see is what is represented in your child's behavior. That, that may scare you a little bit. The truth is they are a reflection of what you have invested in to them. And then week number two, we talked about whoever spares the rod hates their children. <laughs> and we learned that, yes, there's a misapplication of that, but that simply means to create boundaries for their protection and their guidance, not for retribution, not simply for punishment. That discipline serves a corrective and helpful process. And then last week, we talked about honor. We talked about the fact that those who carry weights of responsibility are worthy of honor. Uh, but we also learned that as those who have responsibility, we are to carry that well. And that's what we mean by honor your father and your mother. So you can go back and view any of those online or go to Andy Stanley North Point Church and watch them on there as well. But today, I want to talk about the awesome and painful reality of when you want to quit. If you're a parent or a grandparent or you live next to a kid, you'll know there are times when you just want to pack it in. You want to pack them in, really. Uh, you just want to quit. And we learned about five weeks ago when Nadia was here that uh, she gave, gave, gave this great quote. It's okay to want to quit as long as you don't quit. There are times when you want to quit, but how do we, as those who've been given responsibility to invest in the next generation, don't not quit? How do we persevere and see this thing through. So if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Um, again, if you're not familiar with the Bible, the Bible isn't one book. It's actually 66 books compiled into one. Um, and a lot of them are different uh, styles of writing, but it's basically a library of people interacting with God. And what we're going to read today is actually a letter that was written to a church like us uh, in a place called Corinth. And it was written by a guy named Paul, and he's giving instruction around how to operate as a family. And in the middle of that book, in 1 Corinthians 13, he talks about love. Now, if you've been to a wedding, uh, or you've ever heard someone talk about the Bible and love, you've probably heard this passage. But I want to unpack it in a way that maybe illuminates uh, some ideas for us as parents. Because one of the mottos I lived by as a parent, and now as a grandparent, was... When all else fails, choose love. And I know that sounds like, like, like a t-shirt slogan or something you put on a coffee mug. You're like, sounds good, but what does it really mean? It's just so ambiguous. So today we're gonna actually drill down and look practically, practically at how you can put this into practice in your family. So 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse four says, love is patient. <laughs> All right, how you doing so far? Uh, if you were to scale yourself on the love scale one to 10 on patience, how are you doing? Love is patient, love is kind. That's what we talked about in week one. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. We talked about that a little bit in week two. It does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking. That was week number three. But here's what we wanna focus on today. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. <laughs> Tell that to Instagram and social media. Ah, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. And if you underline or highlight in your Bible, I want you to circle, underline, highlight the word always. It always protects. It always trusts. It always hopes. It always perseveres. Love never fails. Now, I know when I get to this part, people say, oh, Bill, you're wrong. I, I know love has failed. It's failed me. I have failed uh, in other situations. I can tell you story situations where love has failed, and I respectfully disagree with you. I don't think love fails. I think people fail to love. I think love always wins, and that's why Jesus came and died and rose again to prove it. So how do we lean into love? I'm going to give you three practical things that I have learned in my life through painful mistakes uh, and experience on how to navigate this with your own grandchildren or your children or areas where you influence other kids, the next generation. And if you don't have children, just so you know, we as a church family are committed to investing in the next generation. We have taken it upon ourselves to take responsibility 
to do everything in our power to invest. And that's what love demands. So, whenever I would get into a situation where I did not know what to do, and that happened often, especially in those wonderful years called the preteen years, uh, there were times when I was like, I just don't know what to do. I don't know where to turn. I don't have the answer. There was no book that could help me uh, because my situation was unique. I would talk to friends and they were somewhat helpful, but it didn't really fit into my context. Whenever I felt that, the first thing I learned to do was breathe. <laughs> breathe. Because here's what happens. We often react, and when we react, we rarely do it in a great way. It is only through pro proactive decision-making verbiage that we can actually move forward. So in the, in the Bible here in 1 Corinthians 13, it says, love is not easily angered. Now that word in the Greek is paragizo, and it's a combination of two words. It's a compound word. So the word para, means to come alongside, and orgizo means to cut. That's a really interesting word that Paul chose to use here. What he was talking about is that in life, when you are walking beside someone, there are going to be times when you get cut, right? Maybe it's with words, right? Someone will say something like, mommy, why aren't you as beautiful as she is? Wow, right? Dad, where were you when I needed you? Out cuts, cuts. We, we, we verbally cut one another. Um, and so the Bible says, when that happens, because it will with your children, having children cuts, it hurts, because they will say things, they will do things that are hurtful to you. What Paul says in that instance, when you're walking alongside of them, don't cut them back. Oh yeah? Well, you're gonna grow up to look just like me, so get used to it, right? That, no, that's not the right answer. That's not the, that's not the good answer. The, the temptation is to cut back, but Paul says love is not easily angered. It doesn't come alongside and cut back. Go to your room. I hate you too. It doesn't do that. I'm not saying, yeah, sorry, that was a bad example. Go to your room, sometimes it needs to work. We'll talk about that in a second. But, but, but not to cut, not for cutting sake. Another Greek word in the Bible used for anger, it literally means to stir up. And here's what I've learned. Uh, if you've ever stirred something, right, like uh, maybe you're cooking something on the stove, what you will tend to happen is the heavier objects will sink to the bottom, right? Liquid will stay at the top. And when you stir it, those things that are in the bottom come to the surface. It, it, that, that's the word anger here also used in, in Greek. And here's what I've learned about children. They have an amazing capacity. As a matter of fact, any relationship has this capacity to stir things up. Things that you thought you had dealt with, you had buried, were gone, suddenly pop up to the surface, right? <laughs> right? And, that's, and so that's this, this word. It's the stirring up. Um, and so I, I learned my kids were a great gift because they exposed all of my weaknesses. They were a great gift because I, re I didn't realize I was such an angry person until I had children. And then all of a sudden it was like, it was stirred up to the surface. I didn't realize I was so impatient or so unkind. I didn't understand really until that stirring took place. These were things in me that I needed to deal with. And so it was only when I took a breath when I stopped and I allowed God to heal those parts of me that were being stirred up. I allowed God to speak into the parts of me where I wanted to cut back to not do that. Here's a really cool thing. In the Greek, the word for Holy Spirit is paraclete. Uh, again, that's a compound word of two words, para. Remember, you heard that already, to come alongside. And the Greek word kaleo, which means to call. It means that when you create a space between your immediate reaction, your human nature, that part of you that's been stirred up and you create a space for God to speak, it brings healing. Because here's what I've learned, hurt people hurt people. And somebody has to break the cycle. Like, we don't like to admit this, but our kids only can reenact what they have seen or what has been modeled. 
And you say, well, I didn't show them that. You know, well, maybe not, but whatever is being stirred up, love keeps no record of wrongs. So I could remember when I'd get, you know, a little agitated, when I would get angry, my wife and I had to actually work out a code word for me. Um, and she'd say that word, and that word just meant, Bill, breathe. Step back. Right now, you're reacting. And right now, you need to be proactive. You need to step back. Obviously, something's happening inside of you. Maybe it was a bad day at work. Maybe it was a deep insecurity. Like they said something, and it's like, oh, yeah, well, you think their mom is so great, then you go live with their mom, right? I'm reacting to my insecurity. Maybe, maybe it's, it's a deep-seated hurt that I had. Maybe my, my father wasn't there for me, so I'm afraid I'm going to fail my kids, and so I distance, whatever it is. Whenever that stirring takes place, it's an opportunity to breathe, to let God heal you, and to break a cycle. And I took that really seriously. It's creating space for healing and growth. And the best way I learned to do that with my children was to create safe places for them to talk to me honestly. And that's hard. Because they're going to tell you honestly. If you say, tell me honestly, but I have to also do it in a way that I don't react to them in that moment. And I say, yes, I need to hear this. Help us do this together. And so love is not easily angered. Maybe today you just need to take a breath. Maybe you need to just slow down a little bit. Step back. Let God heal you. Maybe God actually is using your children to bring about things that you need him to heal. And if you wanna lean into that, I wanna encourage you to come back tonight to, uh, for our encounter night. We're gonna do a family prayer night. It's a, uh, about an hour, an hour and 15 minutes of just worship and prayer. We're gonna lean deep into this. But I learned, Bill, the first thing you need to do is just step back, breathe. Let God come alongside of you and speak truth because right now you're reacting. The second thing I learned practically is that you have to refocus. So it goes on to say that love does not delight in evil. Uh, that word in the Greek literally is injustice. Evil can be such a, a big word. It just means an injustice. So it means every time you see injustice being, in, uh, being accomplished in your child's life, uh, even if it's you, you've got to weed it out. You are a defender, but you can't just weed it out. You've got to replace that gap that's been pulled out, like when you pull a weed out of the soil, with something else, it rejoices with the truth. It's not enough just to expose the things that aren't good. Parents and our culture, we are great at ex explaining and expressing all the things that are wrong. You don't do this, you didn't do that right. Uh, you should have done it this way. Oh, if it was me, I would have done it that way. And that's not complete. You've got to take the hole that has been pulled out by the weed and you've got to seed it with truth. But I see this in you. I see the good in you. I know you were trying to do so. Yeah, yeah, let's help, let's do that. It's unconditional love. And what does that look like? Well, in John 1, 1, we see Jesus. And the definition of Jesus is he was full of truth and grace. In order to accomplish this, we're gonna need to do a balance of these, of these two things, truth and grace. I came across this great analogy this week of a hand. Think about a hand. A hand has many parts, but I'm gonna talk about two parts, the bones and the flesh. Bones are like truth. Bones are rigid structure that hold everything together. Your hand without bones would be useless. We need structure, that is truth. But nobody wants to shake a skeleton's hand. So we need flesh, we need blood flow, that's grace. Grace is that ability to communicate truth in a way that is accepting, that is helpful. So I know. You just say, well, I'm telling them because it's true. Maybe, but it's not complete unless it's also seasoned with grace. Truth, yes, pulls out what you see that is wrong, but it replaces with what you see is true. And so I, I wrote this, just you need to learn to be firm and you need to be flexible. Now here's what's amazing to me though about parents. Um, many of us are fantastic at planning a vacation. We will literally spend hours planning our week or two weeks away. We are fantastic at planning what we wanna do next week. We got daytimers, planners, calendars. 
we have plans for everything. But what amazes me is that there are very few parents in my experience who actually have a plan for their children. Do you? Do you actually have a plan that you're proactively engaged in to help your children become who they should be? Let me explain what I mean by that. And again, it's not, it's not a judgment or criticism, it's just an observation. We, we spend so much time planning for things that don't really matter. Are you planning for the things that really do matter? I wanted my children to like me when they became adults. I wanted my children, when they had children, to say, hey, dad, would you watch my children? I had to have a plan for that. If I didn't demonstrate that I was capable of doing that with them, I'm pretty sure it wasn't gonna happen when they became adults. If I demonstrate to them that I was an authority figure in their life and not at some point make the transition into a relational friend as well, they would never continue that. I would always be an authority figure. If I wanted my children and I wanted my children to be free thinkers, I wanted my children to challenge every thought, every idea and make it their own. So when they were being sassy, not that that ever happened, it happened a lot. And when they were being sassy and talking back to me, it was like, oh, this is good. I can channel their free thinking. Or when they were super aggressive, like sometimes my boys would get right in my face and I'm like, oh, this is good. They're diving into being a leader and a warrior. I just have to channel that. This is a good thing because I wanted my children to be free thinking, strong individuals who also were kind and compassionate and gave to community. So that's why we did chores. And we got a big cheer last time I mentioned chores. So let's mention it again. Chores are not there to do what I want you to do to get it off my plate. It is a shared responsibility because I want you to learn to be responsible. So when my children would come and say, can I borrow the car? Yes, you can. It's an opportunity for you to explore responsibility. These are the things that need to, to shift, I think, sometimes for us. Because love protects, it hopes, it believes the best. And so do you have a plan? Um, and again, <laughs> I failed at it all the time. I didn't always get it right. But I was really intentional. One of the things that we're really intentional in, I think in our culture, we've dropped the ball on this too, is we don't have rites of passage anymore. So what happens is because we haven't instilled rites of passage, this is just Bill talking, okay? So if, if none of this applies to you, that's fine. This is just Bill talking out loud. What happens is when they can drink, they go on a huge bender because it's their rite of passage. It's our culture's way of saying, okay, now you're an adult, you can do that. And yes, I suppose it's a rite of passage, but it's not a very healthy one. So what if we created healthy ones? And my wife and I explored this idea. So when our kids were 12, all of them, we went away um, with the boys. We took all the men who were influencers in their life. And when they were 12, we said, okay, we're gonna tell you everything you need to know about being a man. And it was awkward because my father-in-law was a part of that conversation. Uh, we're like, oh, we're talking about sexuality. I mean, yes, it was a very awkward conversation. But I wanted them to know, now I see you differently. You are moving and progressing. And that's a part of the plan. It's a part of the process. Whenever we have a birthday party, we make sure that we say words of affirmation, things I see. It's really important that we not only breathe, take a step back, but we also refocus. What really matters? What do I really want here? What is really missing? And how can I bring that back? If you want your family to talk more together, then you gotta put the phones away and you gotta talk. You gotta start, you gotta initiate. You gotta be interested in what they wanna talk about. I know I don't, you don't like Frozen. Okay, that's fine, listen. I don't know princess whatsoever, I have no idea. I'm sure Miles is gonna tell me about things I, I do not really, if I'm totally honest, care about, but I care about him and it matters to him, so I'm gonna let him talk to me about it. I'm gonna get interested in the things that he is interested in. This is a part of encouraging them to become who God made them to be. So you need to breathe, you need to revoke, refocus, and then finally, you just need to persevere. Please don't give up. Please don't give up. 
That's our culture's way of dealing with problems. We just run away. We blame. We try to find a new way, a new relationship. And it's killing us. This word perseverance in the Bible and the Greek literally means, so it has two applications. One is to stand behind. And I think maybe Paul was thinking about a, a, a soldier's shield. And it says, when, when it comes to your children, your grandchildren, the kid next door, be, be a shield, be someone they can stand beside, behind. This world is so difficult. It'll accuse them of all kinds of things. It'll break them down. It'll try to force them into a mold. It'll tell them something that they are not. Be a shield that they can stand behind and be safe. Just the other day, I was out here in front of our building and I was walking down the path and this bird all of a sudden started chirping at me. And it looked like she had a broken wing. And, and so she was kind of limping. So she distracted me and I started walking towards her and then her wing kind of went back in. I'm like, oh, you're just fooling around. So I turned around again and she did it again because she was protecting her nest. I was struck with this reality that she was willing to die so that her nest could be preserved. Do your children, your grandchildren, honestly believe that you would be willing to die so that they could be safe? It can't be just words. It's gotta be in everything that you do. The other application for this word persevere is of a marathon. And if you've ever run a marathon, why? Um, anyway, but that's fine. Uh, we, all have, we all have our, you know, our things, our idiosyncrasies. Um, I call it a character flaw. You call it fun. It doesn't matter. It's fine. Um, but, but I tried that once. And I realized when you're running a marathon or a long distance race, there comes a point where you're like, I just want to quit. Your brain is like, you are just not strong enough. Your lungs are burning. Your legs are rubber. You're like, why did I decide to do this? This was the worst idea I ever had in my life. And I'm only halfway. And that's the worst part. And you think, like, I still keep running. But you do. If you're a marathon runner, you do. You push through. And then there's this really cool thing called your second wind. Something happens. When you're able to break through the limitation, your body kicks in adrenaline. And you're able to finish the race. And there are many times, if I'm totally transparent with you, where I felt like a total failure as a father. And I was like, what, what am I doing? What made it worse was that I would come and I would have conversations with you like this. And I was thinking, I, I'm a hypocrite because I'm not even doing this. Everything inside of me was saying, just pack it in, just give up. But I refused to give up because love perseveres. Love says, I, I see the distance, I see the finish line. This child right now, who is talking back to me one day is gonna have a child of their own. And I wanna be able to model to them how they could maybe navigate this. I may not get it right, but I'm gonna at least try my best. This, this child who's standing here is gonna one day lead a company or lead a nation or lead a family. And I need to fight for them so they know how to fight properly. This child that is in front of me and is causing me all kinds of grief is just strong-willed. And one day God's gonna use that will to do something great for this world. When we start thinking about our children as what they could be, what they should be instead of what they are right now. It allows us to take a breath. God, they're your kids. And in those moments of breathing, God would say, Bill, actually, you're just being a jerk right now. Stop it. Bill, you just need to hug your kids right now. Bill, stop bringing the work burden into the home. Bill, it's okay. I know they said that. They didn't mean it. They didn't mean it. I love you, Bill. Bill, I love your kids more than you will ever love them. I got it. It's okay. You don't have to be perfect. It was in that breathing that I regained my strength to push on. And then it was in my refocusing going, yes, this is what we want, actually. This is how I can direct this, that I was able to persevere. Because Galatians 6, 9 Another letter that Paul wrote to another church in Galatia says, let us not become weary in doing good for at the proper time, 
we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. I remember um, one day, it was not a good day in the Markham household. Um, my kids been fighting all day and I was really tired and I was really frustrated. I, I was being stirred up and I was feeling the pressure of life. And so my kids were fighting, and so I did what I often did. I was trying to do it properly. I just said, just all of you go to your room. Just go to your room. I probably didn't say it the way I should have. <laughs> but they were there in their room, and a few minutes later, there was this huge crash. I was so mad. I burst into that room, and there was one of my children on the floor, and they'd knocked over a table, and something was broken all over the floor. And my first instinct, my first reaction was, what is wrong with you? I just told you to go to your room. Inside of me was this rage, and I realized, Bill, take a breath. Stop. Listen. And so, one of the few times I got it right, I bent down and I looked at this child who was crying, broken, they didn't mean to do it. And I just said, what, what, do, you, what do you need? And he said, I need you, Daddy. Today, if I could be so bold as to sit in the place of your child today, or your grandchild, or that neighbor kid next door who has nobody, nobody fighting for him or that little girl who cries every Sunday when mom drops her off because she's afraid she's afraid of everybody else if I could speak for them and you could hear it I, I, I need you I need you. I need you, Mom. I know it's hard. And I don't always know how to express myself. I know I can be really cutting with my words. But Mom, I just, I need you. Dad, I know I frustrate you. I know I disappoint you sometimes. but I just need you. Grandpa, <laughs> I know I don't do it the way you want me to do it or the way you think the world should be, but I just need you, Grandma. I need you. If nothing else, out of this whole sermon series, sticks with you, just let that stick with you. Why do we fight? Why do we work so hard? Why do we try to get better? Why do we refuse to allow failure to define us, but we persevere? Why? Why do we work so hard to have a plan, to carry the weight of responsibility, to train up a child in the way they should go? Why do we work so hard to create boundaries that discipline and correct our children? It's because they need you. And you need them. Love is patient, love is kind. It's not easily angered, keeps no record of wrongs. It celebrates the truth. It hopes, it protects, it never fails. When I would get to the very end of myself, I would just remind me that love never fails. 
And when I was really stuck, I would just ask myself a simple question, what is the most loving thing to do? And I tried to do that. You don't have to be perfect. You just have to be present. You don't have to know it all. You just have to listen and guide. And when you don't know, God comes alongside to help. I love how Andy Stanley summarizes it. He says, the most significant thing you do may not be actually something that you do. It may be someone that you raise. And I believe right now, across the hall, there are kids. I believe that in one of them, all of them has the potential to change our nation. I believe that the next great prime minister of Canada might actually be in that room right now. I actually believe the next pastor of this church might be in that room. They might be too young. I might not last that long. I might be in that room right now. I actually believe the teachers who are going to turn the tide back to a value system anchored in truth are in that room right now. I believe that the mothers and the fathers who are going to raise godly children are in that room right now and they're yours and they're ours and we have a responsibility and so we take it seriously and I hope you do too but today finally I want to close by reading the prayer the serenity prayer this morning I woke up not feeling good at all and <laughs> I didn't understand it until just before the first experience, I realized that today we were going to battle and that there were things that I was gonna say that someone didn't want me to say because there's someone in this room and you're ready to quit or maybe you feel like you've already quit and today God is calling you back. Maybe you feel like you failed and you're not loved and God is saying, oh, you have no idea how much I love you. And communion wasn't just a religious act, it was a reminder of God's amazing love. And so today, I want you to humor me if you're watching online or you're here in this room. Would everyone just join me in a moment, just close your eyes. And I'm gonna read the prayer, and I want you to own it in your family situation with that child right now who is really difficult with that child who is making really poor choices, with that child that has broken your heart. I want you to pray, God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. So God, as we conclude this series, my prayer is that you would call us back to parenting. Call us back to the hard work of investing in the next generation that so desperately needs wisdom and guidance and love. Help us to take that responsibility to carry that weight, but to do it in such a way that they become who you've created them to be. Not what this world says they should be, not what social media tells them they are, not even what their friends or their schools or the government say they should be, but God, who you have created them to be. We recognize this morning that we are in a battle. And so we take arms. We take arms today to fight for our children again, to fight for this generation. We stand in this place and we declare that we will learn what it means to love and to take responsibility, to be a shield that our children can stand behind, to be a source of strength that they can lean on, to be an ear that hears exactly where they're at, and to be prayer warriors, to pray into our children. God, I ask in your name that we would reclaim a generation of Canadians, no matter where they come from all over the world, you're bringing them to this place. But God, in the name of Jesus, help us to step up and be the parents and the grandparents and the leaders that you have called us to be. It is the only hope for our nation. But God, I am so optimistic because you are good. You are great. You are the great Father. So help us, I pray, in Jesus' name, to reclaim what it means to be a parent in this century. 
for your name, for your glory, for your kingdom, for your will, I pray. Amen and amen. So as we wrap up today, I'm just really, again, even from the first experience, so, uh, so challenged by what Pastor Bill said. Like what a weight it is to be a parent, to be a grandparent, to be someone who has influence over a child. And, you know, listening to what Pastor Bill said, maybe there's some people here who are thinking, that's too much, like, I, I can't be perfect. It's too, it's too difficult. But the thing is, no one's calling on you to be perfect. He's calling you to trust in God. He's that paraclete, the, the one who comes beside us, who helps us. Because each one of us don't have perfect love inherently just inside of us. We need to rely on God. We need His help. And so as, you, as you've sort of taken in that message, just encourage you, don't, don't let this moment pass. Don't let that, that stirring inside of you pass. You know, rely on God. Go to Him. Talk about it with your partner. Talk about it to a friend. And let's really make a, continue to make a difference in the lives of children. See, so parent better, grandparent better, influence better. So as we wrap up today, I think the other thing I have to leave you with this question of what's your next step? Perhaps for you as you're hearing about this parenting thing and hearing about this God who comes beside us and helps us, you you want to discover more. You want to follow Jesus. Maybe today you've made a decision to follow Jesus. That is the best decision you can make in this life. And so we want to make sure that we can help you and connect with you. I think the first thing I'd say, if someone came with you, tell them, ask them. You know, I want to follow Jesus or learn more about following Jesus. Just ask them the question. Let them help you. But you can also connect with us. You can send us a text, 905-937-5610. We'd love to support you. Uh, as you begin your journey following Jesus. Also, we have a team who'd love to meet with you. So outside in the lobby, we have pastors and group leaders who would love to connect with you. Uh, online as well, we'd love to connect with you too. So please reach out online to our online pastor. I just want to make sure you have a meaningful connection, a meaningful conversation before you leave today, today. Especially if this is your first time or you don't really know anyone here, we have folks who'd love to chat with you. So please, before you leave, have a conversation and make a connection. We have those, uh, we have prayer partners up here uh, at the end of our time together. So if you need prayer, please come up. They would love to pray with you, help you through whatever situation that you're going through. Those of you who give faithfully, thank you so much. You can continue in our worship through giving and we have a few options for you. You can go online, centralcc.ca slash give. Or if you head out to the lobby, take a left. There's a giving station on the left-hand side there. Or as you head out to the right, there is a tip tap station where you can just tap to give. And thank you so much for supporting all of what we're doing here and around the world through your giving. One housekeeping note, uh, the communion cups as we head out, could you please just grab those and throw them in the garbage as we leave. And then last thing, if you have any questions about anything from what we covered today about Central, please get in touch. You can scan the QR code in the, QR code in the seat back. You can also head to our website, centralcc.ca slash connect, or you can just text that number, 905-937-5610. It's been so great to spend this time with you. Thank you so much for coming. Have a great week. We'll see you next Sunday.